Hey guys, welcome to No Tux Allowed, uh, that podcast where, you know, we don't talk about uh, Tux, but we do t- sometimes talk about Linux. What's the difference between them? Who the hell knows? But of course, uh, I am joined today by a guest, and only a guest today, because Big Pod decided that he was going to go on a super secret mission, of which uh, it has completely drained him of all health. So uh, he is not dead, but he's also not feeling particularly well, so he's not here with us today. Uh, as to what that super secret mission is, uh, I don't know, but all I know is, is that the context behind it is that family was involved. So uh, we all know that it's the family uh, that that's that's involved in this, not his actual family. But I am joined today by this guy that goes by the name of Zany. Uh, he might uh, you might also know him as Tyler. How's it going today, bud? Doing good, doing good. Uh, it's been a hectic day, but it's been good. Well, uh, I'm glad that uh, you've been able to join me today, even though you joined me just a little late. But then, then again, I forgot that you're one hour behind me as well. <laughs> so I'm sitting here trying to figure out, where is he at? Where is he at? Where is he at? Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I struggled getting uh, it. The browser asked me for permission for my microphone, and I may have clicked the wrong button, then had to figure out how I get it to ask me again. Like, yeah, I had to go through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... I know that uh, I kind of brought you in here last second, but uh, for like the five people that don't know who you are, could you explain what what it is you do for uh, in like a public sphere? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I run a YouTube channel where I make videos about primarily right now Nix OS, but over the course of the YouTube's uh, or channels like Lifetime, I've made pretty much just whatever I'm interested in, which is. Linux. Uh, That's pretty much all I really talk about. Uh, That and gaming. I do like gaming quite a bit. Um, But I do a lot of, I've made Zany OS, which is a Nix OS configuration uh, that some people insist on calling a distro. It's not. It's literally just my config files for Nix. But um, I also, uh, I, I I have my own website and I run websites for other people. And I've also recently started building and um, customizing some firmware for, or layouts for custom split keyboards. I can un- unplug mine. I know this is a primarily audio podcast, so it doesn't matter if you don't see it. But I've got some split keyboards that I've been making. They're um, <clears throat> 34 key uh, keyboards, but. Um, I'm making some with MX keys and KL low profile switches. And uh, I'm preloading a layout that's got documentation, the mentality behind it. It's mostly a QWERTY layout, but uh, I'm going to be selling these here before too long. And that's kind of what I've been up to lately. Oh, I didn't even know about the keyboard thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very recent. Oh, very um, recent. Okay. Well, yeah, um... as of like the past three weeks. Uh, well, just to let design. you know, I don't do product review videos unless your uh, thing, unless your device works with my operating system platform of choice. So, uh, good luck with that, sir. I heard that support for it's pretty hard. Oh no, um, these these right here, I'll have documentation on how you load the key map to it, but um, you just have to go to QMK Configurator uh, in the browser, and you can design a layout, and then you flash it to it, and it'll work. I've used it on Linux, Mac, and I would say Windows, but I literally plugged it up to a Windows um, computer and searched one thing in the browser. So it's not like I tested every key and made sure it worked, but it functions, so <laughs> I mean, should uh, be fine. You're using QMK, which basically is the all the all Windows sees is a keyboard. Yep. And then the keyboard just passes the passes each key press off to Windows, and and the keyboard tells Windows what it's what it's doing, rather than Windows telling the keyboard what it's doing. Yep. That's the beauty of QMK. Uh, you're doing this on the firmware, so yep. it I it should just work. Yeah, I, I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if there's like some kind of problem with like you know if you try to use it on a PS5 or some crap. Like, I wouldn't be surprised, but. It should work with everything you plug into. And the nice thing, too, is like each side of the keyboard has its own microcontroller. So you can easily 
like you know should there be any problems down the line if someone needs to send it back to me to fix or something like that it like if you know one of the microcontrollers goes bad or something like that which shouldn't happen but if it does i can easily fix it i've been really enjoying the split keyboard i don't know if you do you still primarily use your split keyboard uh no not really i also just so uh zany i know that you know that i'm a gen 2 user and very recently i decided i'm gonna give up on gen 2 and seek a a stable platform that just plain works and does not actually change so i i wasn't looking at a rolling release because you know every now and then there's a change that comes out on a rolling release where it changes something like you know a big fancy new plasma update or a big gnome update that completely changes the layout of gnome or anything like that. I didn't I didn't want to have to deal with that. Yeah. And I settled on Debian. Uh because uh it is a long term support release and their their goal is you install it, you run it for five years, then you worry about changes. Now yeah. Yeah. I already gave up on Debian. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, as much as I love Debian, because I used Debian in the past, it was my distro of choice before I got around to actually, uh, quote unquote, learning Linux, as p- some people would say that I've done, where, you know, that's when I started distro hopping and all that. I was a Debian user for roughly about six to seven years, just riding that Debian stable train. Yep. And, uh, I wanted I wanted to come back to like that usage in my life because you know things just worked, but I realized, uh, just like last week, that uh, the reason why Debian isn't working so so well for me now, because I use my computer a hell of a lot more than compared to when I used to, because back in the day we're talking about like twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen that that time range. Uh, that's when I was not really like playing video games on a computer. I had the Xbox and I was playing video games on that. And, uh, you know, I wasn't like doing anything like uh, creating content. Yeah, I, I did make videos back then, but that was just me playing Monster Hunter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, I mean, w- would you, wouldn't you also say like your software like requirements? Like, cause as you, I don't know about you, but as I've used Linux for longer, especially once I started tinkering around with stuff, like what I know I want to use has definitely changed. Like in the Uh, past, I used to be more okay with like, you know, whatever you gave me. But like now I know what I want and it better work. Back in, back then it's just like, I would just install like Debbie, the Debbie and live image where it just comes with all that stuff. And I just wouldn't install Mm -hmm. anything else. Yeah. yeah, You just use what they gave. I didn't need to. Uh, but the, that definitely has changed recently. So uh, I'm trying to, so I actively try to make Debian work for me, right? Actively try. And then I run into these issues with their network stack, of which if you install Debian, the minimal version, you're not using Network Manager. You're not using SystemD NetworkD. You're not using any actual network management daemon. What Debian uses by default is very old school, where they're running a systemd service script to manually call IF up. Now, if you don't know what uh, okay, yeah, yeah, if you don't know what IF uh, the command is, that is the old school networking command where you manually start and set up set up the network connection via kernel commands. Why? Why would the minimal install do that? That I, I don't know because they already have systemd network d enabled. <laughs> so why don't they just use that? <laughs> it's so weird. It is so weird. Uh so I I disable that, right? And I run yeah. an apt upgrade. Well, guess what gets re-enabled? <laughs> it, oh my god, it gets <laughs> every time you go to upgrade it's like, oh, I don't want to use this. So then I decided, you know what, I'm going to take their live images, like uh, the Debian GNOME version that you can that you can somehow mysteriously find an ISO for and download and install it to this day. It uses Network Manager. 
but it also uses that same system D script. Maybe it's just a fallback. Like, maybe. Maybe, but it's a damn annoying fallback that just likes to turn itself back on when you turn it off. <laughs> and uh, I have you... I have come to this conclusion that I have been stuck on these minimal distros for so damn long that I cannot wrap my wee little brain around how Debian is doing this. Like, I just can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't... To me, like, my problem with Debian... Like, I've had issues with networking on Debian before, but not much. Uh, my problem with Debian normally stems from, like... Stale packages. It's not... Well, it's, it's not really just that they're stale. It's like... Like, you actively break packages that are, like, more you know, like modern, like they're more, like I would say more rolling, like, and the problem is, is like with me, multimedia, like, all right, we both do like podcast recording, all that yeah. stuff, all of those programs, like when they get updated, like that shit, like it's good. Like you want it. Like it, it fixes like performance issues, pro like prominent bugs. Like you want the new update and you just, don't get that choice with Debian unless you go like Sid. And then at that point, like personally speaking, I, why are you running yeah. Debian? You're getting a stale version of new packages. Like, you know, cause Sid is not normally those packages aren't even up to like upstream at all. Mm. So it, it depends. It depends. It, it there depends, are some that are It depends that. on where in the stable development cycle you are. Like right now, Sid is about as new as Arch Linux. Yes. Sometimes well, new. But yes, <laughs> but the problem is, is like it. You know, eight months from now, like it's probably this is not. a recording. Yeah. Exactly. This is a recording. Like most people are going to be like, "What are they talking about? It's nowhere near upstream." Like, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the problem with Sid. Like, I don't. To me, like. That's why I've started using NixOS more. It's kind of in the perfect middle ground. Like, you get the bleeding edge. There's also a stable version. But, like, Flakes kind of is that beautiful middle ground where you get rolling release upstream, but you lock it. So you only update when you want to. And you can reinstall without getting new upstream packages, but the ones that you had before. That's kind of the beautiful like middle ground for me. I I don't know though because you're using Gentoo and Gentoo is much closer to upstream. Uh, it depends. Well, pretty much always is. It, it depends. Uh, you're getting packages that are potentially more vanilla than Arch Linux advertises. Yes. Uh, with well, Gentoo because in a lot of cases you're definitely getting them more vanilla. Yeah, because what you're doing is just get cloning from the source. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, and, when it comes just in case anyone wa who's watching doesn't know, like Arch builds packages, not always with flags or mm. you know build stuff that so, source would. So here's the Arch Linux philosophy, right? They have a packaging guideline where the their only quality can. Where a lot of the package maintainers, like these are official team member package maintainers, level of quality is if it compiles correctly. Yes. They don't care if it runs. They just care that it compiles. Yeah. <laughs> they're just doing build tests on them. Which, yeah. So uh, yeah. They're, they're not doing any like run tests or anything like that. And then they just uh, post to publish package to the re repository. So sometimes, you know, your package from the core repository might be broken or, uh, you know, your your package might just be built with missing flags because you know uh, what's the package maintainer going to do because uh i i don't know if you know this but arch linux actually has a big issue with package maintainers right now of where yes. yeah i think last i checked was like one guy that was responsible for like 60 percent of all the packages in the official uh, arch linux repositories that's a lot of work like yep. a lot of work and i don't fault him for you know not enabling the websocket patches in obs studio I'm glad that he's enabling Wayland now. <laughs> well, but... I mean, I to me the big the bigger worry, like I mean, yeah, it sucks that he's got that much workload, but at the same time, 
what worries me a lot is what happens when he just says screw it and walks away like i don't know about you but like i loved arch at one point i was never at the point where like yeah i'll maintain 25 percent of the packages this sounds great <laughs> no yeah yeah, and uh, that's actually a, that's actually a situation where I just about ran into a Solus. Uh, lighted. I was just volunteering to. I was just voluntarily just pushing updates to packages when they were when they were having that uh, repository issue that uh, they that they got fixed. I was one of the guys there. I updated something like uh, thirty packages for for them, and it kind of just got to the point where it's just like I don't want to accidentally become a package maintainer. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I don't know if I actually want to do this because how long am I actually going to stay on this operating system? I don't know. <laughs> well, see, that's that's been my problem. Like I've toyed around with the idea of becoming a package maintainer, but like that is an obligation that I don't know that I'm actually ready to like just say yes to. Yeah, I because I don't want to be that person who signs or like you know becomes a maintainer, maintains like a handful of packages, and then just stops like no like uh yeah the, the thing that i do with like my projects is i write them just for me like mm-hmm. i have scripts and stuff like there yes i do post them publicly like you can go to my dot file repo and you can look in in my uh, dot local bin and you can see all the scripts that i use or i have used at one point which i need to go through and clean those up because there's a lot of there's a lot of them in there i don't even use <laughs> now that I think about it, but uh, I did that recently. I yeah, went back there and cleaned up some ones I wasn't using. Yeah, and uh, and I have all these conf- all these configs like uh, a Hyperland config. Even though I haven't logged into Hyperland in seven months, I don't even know if it works anymore because I think that there was a couple variable changes that they went through. There has, yeah, yeah, and uh, I've just been using Sway this entire time because I have been swayed by the Sway. <laughs> But uh, anyways, uh, I have <coughs> rage quit Debian, and I'm back on Gen 2 as of last night and this morning. And probably... was the was the install smooth? Actually, uh, kind of yes. Although I found out that the plasma meta package of Gen 2 shipping is missing some very key KDE components for an advertised working KDE environment. Uh. Well, when you had mentioned KDE six earlier, it made me think of. Uh, this, I was this talking is, with. This is, isn't KDE six? This is KDE five. Oh, it's not. Shipping. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was talking with I think Arch uh, and uh, Arch Penguin, and he was telling me um, he tried installing KDE six because he had heard, you know, with all the Nvidia, the new Nvidia updates, like it was nice. He had a. Horror. He was like, dude, it was it like it was better than the last time I had tried it. But he was like, it was still buggy as all get out. And I'm like, well, it it's a new version of KDE, man. Like, it's always buggy. Like, let's so, be honest. There's a rule with KDE, right? And that is, every time KDE pushes a big update, you wait a month, and mm-hmm. then you update. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, exactly. It's the same thing that you treat with like the Ub- with the Ubuntu releases. You let you let it bake for a month after it releases, then you update. <laughs> yeah. Like you you have to have the mentality of you see you see the new crap coming out and then you go, "All right. Once people aren't talking about it anymore, that's when it's safe to go check it out and yeah. you're going to have a great time." Not- when everyone's talking about it, it's buggy. That's like, said, it, it, okay. if you want like the premier KDE experience, there's only two distributions that you should actually look at. Mm-hmm. That is KDE Neon, which you know is yep. what KDE themselves develop on. Yep. Or Fedora KDE. Why? Because Neil Gampa puts a lot of fucking work into making sure that thing actually works. Yeah. <laughs> I do like KDE Neon. To me, is probably the most interesting distro. Like you get the like stable base of Ubuntu, but then just the bleeding edge of KDE. That one's a fun one to play around with. Yeah, and uh play around with it. I and yes it is daily drivable, but uh I probably wouldn't. <laughs> N- neither would I, but I mean I could easily see someone doing that and it's a fine distro. Like I don't 
I wouldn't have any problems if he forced me to run it for a week. Like it, I'd be fine. I don't like KDE, but I'd be fine. And I paid you like two hundred bucks to uh, ru- run stuff for a week before, or I think I paid yeah. you fifty dollars to run like uh, what was it, Plan Nine, Nine yeah. Front, or whatever it was for a week. Yeah, and, uh, that was rough. That yeah. was a rough week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get like anything done. I could, I could, I had fun tinkering around with it, but good lord, Plan Nine, like I, I, I highly doubt you could even possibly get a graphical like browser much less ever run a youtube video. like good lord i think running a youtube video would be an accomplishment well just to let you know gen 2 does still package the window manager in the main repository Ooh. the plan 9 window manager yep it's still there <laughs> I, w- I wonder if it works have you tried it uh no because it's xorg Ah. Uh. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, and uh, you might see this blue box here behind me that says Arc on it, and uh, Arc doesn't necessarily work with uh, X11 too well. Still, yeah. it, it's better, but every now and then your screen will pause for like a good 15, 20 seconds, and you'll think that you crashed your computer. Then all of a sudden, everything will be working perfectly fine, like it never happened. Well, that doesn't really upset me all that much. I mean, Wayland's the way everything's moving. Those are new cards. I mean, it makes They're sense. To, it makes sense for Intel to not care. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. coughs> but speaking of a hardware company that actually wants to care or is trying to care, uh, how much have you looked into like these new Qualcomm CPU chips? Um, not much. I have looked into the, uh, the Qualcomm like big server like computers like with like 64 cores stuff like that uh, those are pretty cool they're expensive but they're cool it's about two grand but you get like i think it's like 64 threads or maybe it's 128 threads 64 cores i can't remember it's big arm cpu you get like 128 gigabytes of ram like which on an arm system dude, do you know how much you could do with that that'd be <laughs> wild right now, uh, so I opened up YouTube, and uh, in my suggestions, I had this wonderful recommendation by uh, this uh, individual uh, called Lon.tv. Uh, typic- this guy is like a general tech reviewer, but every now and then, he'll delve into like these Linux things, and I treat him as like that that somewhat technical but still new to Linux kind of user. And he managed to get a uh, HP Omnibook, which is one of the books using this uh, Snapdragon X CPU. And uh, he did, went through and did a, did a whole review on the device. And he did that thing that a lot of these laptop reviewers don't do. And he's just like, now nah, let's, let's install Linux. And uh, he found out that HP is using a standard UEFI implementation which is good. It's not a locked bootloader. That's good. Yes, absolutely. So he tries to install everybody's favorite Linux distro on it. And which one do you think that is? Debian? It's not Debian. It's Ubuntu. Oh, thank God. It's oh, Ubuntu. God. And guess what didn't work? Mm, I'm going to guess like The dock didn't work right. Some of the plugins or some like something really weird. Well, uh, what if I told you that the system just didn't even want to post? Well, with actually, their arm build. Well, it it would post, and you would get the grub prompt, but the kernel would fail to load. Oh. Yeah. Well, uh, I did very very high level digging into this. So I grabbed an Ubuntu ARM image. I spun up a, vir- a ARM virtual machine. And in the live media, I typed in a uname tack R. You know, just the general Linux command to find your the version of the currently running kernel. I got kernel 6.8.3. I'm like, hmm, I wonder where the Qualcomm drivers are. Because they're, they're supposed to be in Linux, right? They advertise it. 
Yeah. So I go to Qualcomm and I'm looking around uh, their developer blog. Well, it turns out that Qualcomm does, in fact, package drivers for the CPU. That's the CPU with the with the video uh, drivers, and they're in the Linux dash next repository, which is slated to be Linux six point ten or six point eleven. Just whenever Linus decides that he's going to sign the commits. So that's why it didn't work. That sucks. <laughs> that sucks. So close. Yeah, but uh, with this video that he posted, it made its way to Reddit. And Reddit did the thing that Reddit does where they don't realize this. And now all the Windows fanboys are saying, this is why Linux sh- Linux sh- d- j- sucks. Because, you know, it doesn't work on this. You have to go through all these hacky steps to be able to fix it and make it work and everything. Because you can't use Linux on, on this thing on day one. Of course. Yeah. It's Reddit. <sighs> you know, that happens. I'm trying not to feel triggered right now. <laughs> hey, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I give a lot of people on Reddit, like benefit of the doubt. A lot of people don't know how software works and don't understand that like windows, like, like the company designs this shit to run windows and arm is new and it takes Linux a while. And Ubuntu is not the most new Linux. Like it's just, it's just not. It never will be. <laughs> it's not. It never, well, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be. A, exactly. It just works distro. <laughs> of which uh, Ubuntu came out with an LTS release as their last release, which basically means that they're not really pushing anything innovative. That's the next Ubuntu release. Actually, that's the next three exactly. Ubuntu releases. This release is just like we're going to hold our horses. This is the thing that's supposed to last a little bit. So uh, let's make sure that stuff actually works in this release. So they're not yeah. going to chase like the newest thing. I don't even think that I don't even think that right now the version of Nautilus that they're using is the is uh as current as the version of GNOME that they're using. I think that I think Nautilus is actually an order package, if I remember right. I don't actually know off the top of my head because I already rage quit Ubuntu like four weeks ago, so I didn't even think to check back then. But anyways, well, uh, that's Well hold on. I, I I would like to say I think it's funny that people treat Linux like sometimes poorly online because it doesn't support the latest and greatest hardware when literally one of the selling points for Linux is that it gives your old hardware new life. So like the fundamental idea is that you can save money and buy something that's not brand new the next time you need a computer and you're the one you have lasts longer. Like what? Why is it a bad thing? It doesn't support the thing that came out two months ago. It kind of just comes back to that open source development model where it's just inherently slower than the proprietary options. Because uh, when when it comes to open source, especially like the Linux kernel, uh, the Linux kernel is by no means a small project. Like, uh, there are probably more people that touch the Linux kernel than Microsoft Windows. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, there's no big money-making entity that behind the Linux kernel that says, I want Copilot. Exactly. Give, well, give I mean, me there co-pilot. there are there are definitely like monetary interests behind Linux, but there aren't ones that dictate like the entirety of the Linux kernel's development. Like they can influence small portions. Like we want these drivers put in here ASAP. Like <clears throat> you can influence it, but that doesn't mean you're actually getting. You know, like you're not going to steer the Linux project into making sure the latest and greatest hardware, all of it works. Like, that, Yeah. That, that, that's not going to happen. Because, you know, at the end of the day, yes, there is one guy that is a benevolent dictator of life for, for Linux. That, his name is Linus Torvalds. And uh, if he really wants to, he can push something through. But uh, yeah. he has been a fantastic citizen of open source by saying, let's not rush this. I want to hear some feedback on this patch before I hit the, hit the go button. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, he's he's... <laughs> As much crap as, as he's been given for, I'm, I'm going to be honest, like, it's hard to deny that he's not an arsehole sometimes. But if you give him that one flaw, everything else about him has been super great. 
he he hasn't kowtowed to like um, corporate interests. He doesn't he doesn't bypass stuff because someone wants it in there quick. Like I don't. I don't think you could ever say Linus Torvalds has ever been like, we need to push these this this update through. Don't worry about the testing. Trust me, we need it in now. I don't think that's ever happened. Well, so. there's been a few times where that actually has, like the whole Spectre meltdown mitigations. Well, well not that without had, tests. Well, like, yeah, it had testing, <laughs> yes, but very little. And when he pushed the, when he pushed the patch that uh, caused like the massive performance decrease for CPUs uh, that yeah, that, that we've yeah. got for it. He literally apologized, saying that yes, this is the best we could do. It, it the issue is that bad. We're just going to rush this through, and uh, we'll we'll have to figure out how to make it better in the future. I think that I think that's almost literally what he said. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in his defense, though, it was really bad, and I don't think they could have done better that quickly like yeah and to me i'd much rather have worse performance than you know no more cpu bye bye <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i'll take that yeah but uh so let's let's move on to the next topic here and uh this is actually some good news because uh, i know that uh i know that you're sort of a fan of flat packs, right? I'm a fan of flat packs for other people. Yeah. I am not a fan of them personally. Yeah, but uh, you understand the point behind them and how the communities really just yes. kind of just embrace them as like a standard overall for packaging. Yes. And I also think I think it's a good thing for the community. Like well, I I I do like flat packs. Okay. Very much. Okay. Now we Now uh you and I both know that flat hub is probably the one repository for flat packs that matters. And, uh, yes. they, they, they have a status page that people have been watching. And of course, uh, I got this from Reddit again. Sorry. Uh, I know that some people don't like the fact that I use Reddit to find some of this stuff, but you know, it's a great resource for like just getting fed news, exactly. <laughs> but flat hub has passed 2 billion package downloads. And uh, that is a lot. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of these flat packs that you install, they're not small. And uh, they, some of them take them take minute to install. And uh, I don't know if you noticed this lately, but, like, uh, Flat Hub has, their repository has seems to at times get really, really slow at, dist at distributing. So uh, I think that's something that they mentioned in, in, like, a recent blog post that they need to go go through and work on. But uh, two billion downloads means that the, that repository is very, very, very busy. Yeah, light of this, these are lifetime downloads. They're not like active downloads, so you, they're not getting two billion downloads today as you're listening yeah. to this. But oh, uh, oh god, if we hit that point, that's gonna be rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're uh, that's gonna be a very busy content delivery network because they're not self-hosting that completely. <laughs> no, no, that's that. that your download speed gonna get hit hard <laughs> yeah and uh you know i think that that's a point that we can just notate in history because uh flathub announcing these numbers I, I mean how many people are downloading off of snapd i don't think it's nearly that many or, or... well i mean you you could probably make the argument that because ubuntu is making a lot of the like core system snaps they can manipulate the numbers to make it seem like it's way more just because people are installing Ubuntu. But I don't really, like, if I use an Ubuntu system, I go out of my way to not use Snaps. Like, I don't want Snaps. I, I know some people very much like them, but I have problems with Snaps. Like, still to this day, so... <laughs> Yeah, and because of that, th this is like a number that we can actually track because, you know, not a lot of these distros actually go out and say how many package downloads that their repositories are getting hit by because, you know, that leads back to telemetry and tele and in the world of Linux distros, uh, telemetry equals bad. So uh, it it's interesting that they, that they actually published this number 
And uh, I think that ultimately it's it's a good show concept that like uh, if you're if you're say like Adobe and you're wanting to finally port Photoshop to Linux, you could use this as an argument for packaging it as a flat pack. Yes. Like, well, actually, and also, I to me personally, like I think Flat Hub needs to be the main repository. Flat Hub is a beautiful repository. Like it. It genuinely is, and it's also managed very well. One of the biggest arguments, like, I know I've had, Matt's had, uh, I'm pretty sure you've had, uh, with distros like Elementary OS and, like, others that may they may have changed this. I haven't checked them out in quite a while, but uh, I know others will do this where they, they want to run the system solely off of flat packs. Like, that's all they want to use. And then they don't include flat hub. That is the biggest mistake and argument against distros that want to just use flat packs I've had. Like you have to include flat hub. That's where all the packages are. It yeah, needs which, to come from uh, Fedora has made some steps to address. Like uh in the in the Fedora installer, like their onboarding uh screen that they run you through and everything. They have the button for allowing thir uh, third-party repositories. That does turn on FlatHub. Yeah, yeah. Flat it, Which you, you need. I don't, and I don't even think it has the filtered FlatHub anymore either. So you get full FlatHub right there. And it's just enabled out of the box. Of course, they're going to prioritize their own Flatpak repository. Yeah. But uh, to this day, like, uh, I, I use Flatpaks on my system, and the only repository that I really use is FlatHub. Because uh, you can... Using just Flatpak, you can count how many packages are in the Flathub repository compared to all the others. Elementary OS only has like 40. Yep. Fedora has like 100 and so. Flathub has over 2,000. <laughs> yep. And uh, Flathub has all the packages that Elementary and Fedora are already packaging to begin with. So what's the point yep. of turning those repositories on? Exactly. Because then you, then you get literally just two entries for Discord, two entries for Steam, two... Like, why? Yeah. Like, just give me flat hub. And like, uh, you know, I I I've seen some people make arguments in favor of flat flat pack over snap, and their only valid point is that you can use different repositories with flat pack, but at the same time, there's only one that actually matters. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of an invalid argument because you know, there's only one repository that you probably should be using. I think there's a lot better arguments for Flatpak over Snap. Uh, there than... definitely are, but one of them definitely is not the developer experience. Like uh, I can go, I can Google how to make a Snap package, and get a step-by-step -step guide on how to write the YAML file and tell SnapD how to build a package. That you don't get that with Flatpak. That sort of doesn't exist with Flatpak. Not as smoothly it does exist but it's not nearly as smooth as snaps there is a third packaging format that we should probably discuss a little bit because you know i do make use of these too i'm talking about the venerable app image well all right look as much as i can make use of an app image and i would prefer if app images were a standard like I think they're like I think it's dying. Like there is not very many things that are getting released as app images anymore. Like it's very uncommon. Well, there are still there are two applications that I know of where they still treat app images as first party. Uh, that is Caden Live and Bitwarden. Yeah. Uh, I know of one other crypt text which is like a encrypted like email client they are also there for linux they only release an app image yeah but uh, i still think that there's a use case for like that binary that you can just download which uh that is yeah. what the app image is uh i, know well, I think that's what we all want yeah am, am i wrong like i mean uh so like uh, for like my dungeon dragons campaigns I use a map drawing tool called uh, Dungeon Draft. Uh, they don't publish an app image. Instead, what they do is they ship a Linux compatible binary that you just dot slash run to execute. 
Uh, that's their that's their Linux build. Lighted, uh, they package like a whole desktop file for you and everything that you can use. But uh, the, I I legitimately think that that's better used as an app image because uh, that that's something that you buy off of uh, the humble bundle. Mm-hmm. You you pay twenty bucks and you have the software for life. I mean, yes, it's not free and open source, but you know it's a darn good tool, and uh, that's a so- that's a software development model I can support. You know. Pay twenty bucks yeah. forever, twenty bucks yeah. and have it forever. I mean, uh, I'm the same way. Yeah. Like, it, as long as you make a good product, like you, that kind of business model, I really don't care. Like, if if it's not open source, as long as as long as it has something like that, I can get behind that. Yeah. If Discord was like that, if I could pay like for Nitro, like you know, like a hundred dollars for a lifetime, dude. I'd be all about that. Well, uh, speaking of Discord, can I go on a rant about Microsoft Teams? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I can get uh, behind you on that one. I am a former business owner, which meant that I paid that Office 365 subscription, which meant that I had Teams and I made use of Teams. You know what I much prefer using over Teams at this point? Anything? Discord. <laughs> Yeah, because unlike Teams, Discord actually notifies you when you get a message, <laughs> and uh-huh. it notifies you on time. <laughs> you can share files via Discord much more reliably than you can Teams. Even Discord even has better Microsoft Excel integration than Teams. So let, let me ask you: When you've used Teams. Have you ever had the white input box bug? Oh, the white input box you can't put anything into? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How? Like in a primarily messaging application. How does that, how do you do that? How, how do you does mess messaging up not box? work? <laughs> 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 Which I'm thinking to myself, Discord, if you decided that you were going to be less gamer centric, and just look at making a Teams alternative, it's not going to be that much more work than what you're already putting in now. And that's something I could actually pay for Nitro for. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, the best part about Discord is, like, it's just a branding issue. All they have to do is do, like, Discord business, where, like, you, it's a separate part of Discord. Discord like for your... Enterprise. <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, it's a branding issue. They can totally do it. And it... And honestly, I can say this, I I have had, like, I've worked with people who wanted to use something other than Discord, and I've gotten them to, like, I do a lot of business through Discord, because it is more reliable than using something like Zoom, or Teams, or Skype, and, like, the worst part is, is, like, you'll hop on one and like you know, the messaging works just fine. It's all great, but then the video call is for some reason not working that day, buggy, whatever. Like with Discord, like the only thing that is ever a problem is when you join the call, your audio is all kinds of messed up. You got to get it fixed, but then it's fine. Yeah, like, and uh, honestly, a lot of times all I have to do is just disconnect and reconnect. That too. Yeah. 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 And. Uh honestly like discord makes a solid project product yes i mean th- there is a lot of telemetry in that discord client yes and absolutely it, it gets very concerning at times yes but that doesn't mean that the product is bad yeah i mean it can be finicky and annoying at sometimes but i haven't found a solid video sharing like tool that doesn't at some points become finicky and weak. Like yeah. they'll all have their pain points. Now, but... uh, the only alternative that the Foss world has to discord. And uh, I'm certain that there's going to be a self host. And I'm going to make cry as soon as I say this, the next cloud talk plugin. I don't know if you've ever used it before Zany, <laughs> but think of teams that actually works. And that's Nextcloud Talk. I need to try it out. I like I've literally never heard of it at all. 
Oh, okay. But yeah, it, it's just a plugin for Nextcloud. Uh, you just uh, turn it on, and uh, yes, it does tax your Nextcloud server quite a bit. So probably don't be running it on your five dollar Linode VPS like I tried. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, this thing can pull some this this thing uh, can pull some memory if if it really wants to. But uh, I Ooh, have this made, thing looks nice. It is. It's super nice. It's fantastic. All you have, and it supports Vim commands too. Get out of here! Really? It does. So you can type in. You can just hit slash, and you can just start typing for your search, or you can hit okay. Uh, I col- or or you can hit like colon, and you can type in commands on the next cloud talk. Brother, get out of here! I know yeah. what my, I know what I'm yeah. doing. This and I, it, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna play Daisy more after we get done. But later on, I'm definitely yeah. Uh, of Xbox. course, uh, the only issue with that is that you're hosting a Nextcloud server, which uh, that can cause some issues in itself if you're not prepared for them. But if you're prepared for them and you read the Nextcloud release notes ahead of time and you know exactly the steps that you need to do, because you know, you're being a smart sysadmin and you're not running just one Nextcloud instance, but you're running a production instance and a test instance, you can probably make it a very smooth experience for everybody that's not you. <laughs> well, to, to me, I think the most important part with Nextcloud in general is when you're going to set it up exactly what you said before read the new stuff like not just the install but keep up with like or try to go and check out updates and like because there's always there's always something going on with next yeah like, there there always is and it's 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 honestly things that i'm legitimately excited about like uh yeah uh the, they just had a release. I don't know what's all in it, but you know the release before they introduced all kinds of AI, uh, artificial intelligence integrations, large language models, and uh, mm-hmm. they they did a good job of it because you know it's all optional. You can just turn yeah. it on or just not have it turned on, and they'll give you like warnings as to uh, how bad this AI is with your user data or you know uh, how good it is, and they do a very solid job of it. But anyways, guys, I think that's going to be it for the, for the show here today because, you know, uh, my recording here says it's already 58 minutes, which, uh, you know, it's probably going to be edited down a little bit shorter than that. But if you would like to give us some feedback on the show, we have an email address. Just send us an email to contact at tuckspace.com. Uh, that'll, that'll send an email that, for, that forwards to not just myself, but also Big Pod. Unfortunately, Zany, you're not going to get an email out of it, but it's fine. <laughs> you can tell us all the things that you didn't like about Zany in that email address. Yes, uh, yeah. absolutely. Uh, our intro and outro music is "I Don't Know" by Grapes. Uh, you can uh, there's a link to to the CC Mixer page where this was published like uh, 20 years ago at this point in the description down below or in the show notes if you're watching us. Uh, you can find us at these links that are showing up right now on the screen at these various uh, Mastodon instances. And uh, Zane, I don't know, I haven't seen you on Mastodon lately. I don't know if you go there very often, but how do people get a hold of you? Uh, well, I do have a mask on, but I'm pretty much never there. Discord is the best place to get a hold of me. Uh, you can you can go to my YouTube channel, and I do have uh, like I believe I've got my email on there. Uh, I'll go ahead and warn everybody. I tell everyone this: uh, if you email me and it's two weeks before you got a response back, it's not because I don't like you or anything. That is actually the average response time for my emails. Uh, if you get a response back the next day, you are in incredibly lucky so yeah hit me up through discord if you want a pretty actual response response. (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) but yeah um i completely lost my train of thought but yeah you hit me up on discord (laughs) yeah yeah hit Hit, hit him up on Discord. I'm sure I'm certain that you can find an invite link for Discord on like many of his vi- YouTube videos. Yes. Uh, his YouTube channel is just youtube.com slash at zanyog, if I remember right. Yep. Uh, and if if you're feeling to be generous to help us with this show, because uh, we do this thing that a lot of podcasters seem to have forgotten how to do. We actually have a server that distributes this podcast to the client that you're listening to us on. It works through this magical protocol that's free and open source and established 30 years ago at this point, I think, called RSS.1.8, where it, where all your podcast client does is it goes like, hey, is there a new version of this file available? Cool, there's a new version of this file. 
hey, there's a new entry here. Where do I get that entry from? It will reach all the way out to this lonely little server in Atlanta, Georgia, where it goes like, hey, I heard you have this file. Can I get it, please? And the server just provides it, provides your your uh, podcast client a video file along with show notes. Turns out that that's actually not free. So uh, if you would like to support us, in that same contact email, tell us. Just like, hey, how do I send you guys money? Or like, <laughs> hey, I don't have money to send you, but I, if you have like products to buy, I want to be able to buy them. Of course, I have no idea what it, what it, how I want to monetize the show. Like, I, I don't want to do like advertising, just like ever. <laughs> I don't want yeah. to have to do that. I want to be fully community funded. And uh, to do that, I need to know how the community wants to fund me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I can do the Patreon thing. I don't want to do, like, extra content for the Patreon thing because that means that now I actually have to do work. <laughs> but if I have yeah. to, I will. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not particularly expensive. So I can keep it, I can keep this rolling for a while just out of my own pocket. But, you know... I, I wouldn't mind, you know, like some assistance with it in the future because uh, it, it's costing me money. And it's not a huge amount of money, so I'm not going to go broke anytime soon. So don't worry about that. But it is a negative investment. And, uh, you know, it, it's not that the lack of support makes this show impossible because I started the show as a passion project. I'm And, you know, I love that still a passion product project to this day because realistically... It's one day out of my entire week that I work on the show. <laughs> it's not worth any more than that. But if you definitely you should like, do a Patreon though. It, well, but definitely should. It, yeah, I I appreciate uh, the people that, that would like to. I I just want to know what people want to actually do. Like, uh, do people want to give me money on Patreon? Do they have another service? Do they just want to send like a a PayPal uh, transaction or you know, you know something like that? Just let us know. But in the meantime, guys. That is No Tucks Allowed, episode 14, I think. We'll see you next week.